excited. Brian always has a face whenever I do that little uh, woo thing. Uh, so I'm, I'm Dan Garcia, and I'm delighted to be co-teaching this course this semester. Um, this is a brand new course, and I'm sure you probably knew uh, from the website and so from other PR. How many of you are here because of the ad we put in the newspaper? Okay, lesson okay. learned. Ad newspaper okay. ads didn't work. All right, uh, no hands went up. So, what welcome newspaper? to CS10. They're all looking at. It. Yeah, welcome to CS10. Who Dan. saw the ad in the in the Daily Cal? Oh, okay. Well, that's two. Okay, that was good. <laughs> okay. Um, so the title of the course is the beauty and joy of computing, and this is a brand new course. A year ago, we taught a two-unit version of this course as kind of a pilot offering to see if, if, if Scratch, the language we were using, and BYOB, the extension, could hold up to university pounding on it. And it did. It held up wonderfully. So we decided, let's go full force, expand the language, make a full four-unit course. And in fact, we're replacing the other Introduction to Computing for Non-Majors course, CS3L, titled Introduction to Symbolic, Com Symbolic Programming. So the CS3L is gone. Never again to be taught. CS10 is now the replacement. So we're really excited about, from this point of view of computer science, sharing the love and the joy and the beauty and the joy of computing with non-majors and majors too. It actually is a push to make this the course that everyone takes coming through, and we're really excited about that. Just some context, this course was chosen as one of five national pilots for the new advanced placement course on computing called APCS Principles. And that's really exciting. If you're interested, the website csprinciples.org, csprinciples.org, I'll write after this, um, is a place that describes that project. And we are one university example of a course that may get modeled back at the high school level at 10,000 new high schools. It's a brand new course in the high school, so they're trying to expand this to 10,000 high schools. And that's really exciting. So that, that our course might be a model for what gets taught in the high schools is really a fun thing. We'll teach this again next semester and then hopefully every semester after that. So we're really very, very happy about this. We've got two outstanding teaching assistants we probably should introduce. Uh, so you can stand up and introduce yourselves and maybe the camera can get over to who the folks are. Go ahead, tell us. So hi, I'm John. Um, I'm the TA for the 4 to, four to 6 lab. I'm on his Wednesday and 4 to 5 labs on Friday. So hello. Um, I'll be one of the TAs for the class, and I'm really excited for you to see you guys here. Um, that's it, really. What else do I say? Uh, hello. Research. <laughs> Research. <laughs> what, are you, what are you doing for your, for your study? Oh, um, so I'm a first year grad student, but I was also an undergrad here for, so I've been here for four and a half years. I'm an oldie. Um, I do EX as my research, but I also have a particular focus on ed education as well. Um, yeah, and hello, world. <laughs> All right. And a cat in my shirt. Yes. <laughs> always. Always. <laughs> my name is Luke. I am the GSI for the other two early sections and the early two discussions. This is my first week at Berkeley, so John is far more experienced at Berkeley things, but I'm quickly, hopefully, learning my way around. Um, I'm a first year master's student working in computer science education and online community research, and um, I'm really glad to have you guys here as well. Woo! Woo! So Brian's going to tell you more about, yay, great stuff. So, and we have, if you look on our website, we've got so many wonderful, shining, happy faces to help you with, read, with regard to readers and lab assistants. We've got so many excited people who are about this course. This course has really gotten a lot of energy on the CS side, so we're really happy about that. Brian will tell you more about the details of the course being half computing and half programming, half kind of the talking about the social impact of computing and history and half kind of learning how to program in this wonderful language. Brian can tell you more details about that. Just one last note on the AP. We're going to be um, poking and prodding you because they really want to know whether this course works, right? They're going to compare this course to five other courses across the country. So we'll be having some surveys before and after. We're still working with them to figure out the exact details of the survey. But we're going to have some more surveys that you probably surveyed more than other courses. But come on in. If you come in late. All right, so I'll leave it to Brian. Today's Brian's turn to lecture. Brian and I are going to be kind of sharing the lectures. We're also going to be having some guest speakers, outstanding faculty from across campus, and maybe even some folks from industry coming back and telling us how their particular technology works. We, have, we already have Twitter coming to talk to us, and that's really exciting. Maybe some other folks uh, from industry coming in as well. So it's going to be a really exciting semester. Anyway, Brian, it's all you. Okay. So as you can tell, Dan is in charge of joy, so that makes me the beautiful one. <laughs> Um, I'm Brian Harvey. Um, I'm uh, interested in 
the use of computers in teaching kids younger than you. That's sort of my field. Um, and uh, so I had a lot to do with the development of BYOB, which is the extension to Scratch that we're going to be using. Scratch is a language. Who's, who's seen Scratch before? A few people. OK. Scratch is a computer programming language designed for kids. Um, so it was designed to be really, really easy to get started in, which is why we thought it would be good for non-computer science majors. Um, but because Scratch is designed for kids, there are some things that it didn't do. And uh, so some other schools who have courses like this um, use Scratch for like the first week or two and then switch to some real language, um, uh, which is a kind of bait and switch, I think. Um, and we wanted instead to extend Scratch so that it could actually do the whole curriculum. And that's what we've done. And I'm really excited about it. Um, OK. OK, so as Dan said, um, there's the practical half of the course, which you do in lab, learning to program computers. And then there's the big ideas um, component. Uh, which involves the lectures and the discussions. So you'll spend some time sitting around in a small group um, talking about things. Um, uh, really do talk in the discussions, by the way, or else it kind of defeats the purpose. Don't leave it all up to the TAs to carry the ball. Um, right, so one of the reasons for this whole new course is we want you to understand that there's more to computer science than just how do you write a computer program. Um, it's true that there's a lot of programming in the curriculum, but there are other things, too. And we want to give you a broader introduction um, to it. So, uh, so we're going to talk about um, some aspects of social context of computing and also some of the theoretical computer science ideas about some measuring how good a, an algorithm is, a process for computing something or other, um, some of the limits of computation, uh, some of the history of computer science. For example, in a few weeks, you're going to learn how one of the first ever computer scientists more or less single-handedly won World War II, uh, for the good guys, um, by uh, breaking the secret German code and getting information to the allies about what the Germans were up to. Without that, we would have probably lost the war. So this week's big idea is abstraction. Uh, this is probably the central idea of all of computer science. Um, so it's worth talking about. And um, I also teach 61A, which is our first course for CS majors um, that assumes some programming background. So some of you, actually, there's a question. How many people are, as of now, planning to take 61A in the spring? Oh, a lot of you. Great. OK, so you'll get to see me again. Um, and you will hear me say, Computer programming is really easy. Come on in, have a seat. Yeah. Um, computer programming is really easy as long as the program you're writing is small. So the world is full of 12-year-old computer programmers, and, and they do interesting work, uh, but not great big programs, sort of industrial strength. You know, can write characters from right to left for Chinese people, <coughs> stuff like that, programs. Um, when you write big programs, what's hard is controlling complexity. And abstraction is about controlling complexity. And I know that that's a lot of big words, and you have no idea what I'm talking about. But bear with me, uh, and you will. Um, so the solution to the problem of complexity is chunking or layering. So instead of thinking about your problem in itty-bitty little pieces, you take some of the itty-bitty pieces and put them together and give them a name. And then you can think about your problem in terms of bigger pieces. And you keep doing that until you have very big pieces that um, you can kind of think about all at once. Uh, so chunking is one metaphor for abstraction. The other is layering, where you start with very low-level things, and you build on top of that higher-level things, and on top of that higher-level things. So the classic example is thinking about uh, what's under the hood in a car, an automobile. Um, so what are cars made of? Well, really, if you look carefully, cars are made of nuts and bolts and, and metal rods and little paper gaskets and, and uh, rubber hoses and things like that. Um, each piece of metal, by the way, 
is made of atoms, right, which are made of electrons and protons and neutrons, which are made of quarks. So there's lots of levels of abstraction even below the things that you ordinarily think of as the basic units, like a bolt. Um, that's made of something, too. But if you're trying to repair a car, uh, you don't think about it in terms of quantum physics, right? You think about it in high-level terms. You think about things like, this is the engine, or this is the alternator, or this is the transmission. Um, and that's abstraction, okay? So taking the little pieces of the car and grouping them into bigger units and thinking in terms of the bigger units. And there are two reasons that that helps. One is that there aren't so many of the bigger units, so you don't get lost. And the other is the bigger units are more meaningful. You can say what the purpose of the transmission is. Right? Whereas it's hard to say anything interesting about what's the purpose of this particular bolt you know, inside the car. Um, Okay, so the march of technological progress, which has been going on for you know, a couple of millennia, is at least in part a march toward greater and greater abstraction. So arguably it's abstraction that enables technological progress in every field. It's certainly true about computer science. Um, so sticking with cars, in the earliest days of automobiles, everybody who drove a car had to know at least something about how to fix them because they broke down all the time, right? And so you couldn't drive an automobile unless you understood the car at a pretty low level of abstraction. Um, and your cars got more reliable after a while, but you still had to know some things about how the car worked in order to drive it. And in particular, the main example I'm thinking of is um, the transmission, as I mentioned before. So... Um, it used to be that there were only manual transmissions, not automatic transmissions. And so in order to drive a car, you had to think about why the car has different gear ratios and what that's all about, and low gear is for more power, and high gear is for more speed, you know, cruising speed, and all of that stuff. And you had to know things about how to shift gears, which involves pushing down the clutch, and there's a lot of complicated timing involved. And in the really old days... Um, uh, you had to know how to double clutch if you wanted to be able to downshift. Anybody know what double clutching is? Nobody's heard of it, right. Um, no, no, no. Is it to synchronize the speed of rotation of the gears? Exactly, exactly. If you wanted to, what you had to do was hit the clutch, get into neutral, rev the engine, hit the clutch, and get into the lower gear that you wanted. Um, otherwise, the gears grind, you know, grind against each other. And it, anyway, it was really, really hard to drive a car because you had to think in low-level terms about how it worked. And the invention of the automatic transmission was the main enabling technology for a really wonderful abstraction that we have today. Today, basically, you want to drive a car. There are two pedals. The one on the right makes the car go faster. The one on the left makes the car go slower. And that's all you have to know, right? Um, and suddenly, anybody could drive a car. It was really a big deal when that happened. Now, side comment. Uh, the widespread use of cars has turned out to be a mixed blessing uh, because of pollution and global warming and you know, having to fight wars in Iraq to get more oil and things like that. Um, driving. Drunk driving, yeah. There, there are a lot of reasons. Um, so just like computers... Cars are not a completely wonderful, no problems technology. They are wonderful, but they have problems associated with them. And you're going to learn in this course that the same thing is true about computers, about the use of computers and the social impacts of computers. Um, so, in fact, many historians of science don't like to use the word progress at all because they think progress brings in implicitly the idea that every new technology is completely good. You know, and instead they talk about technological change, which is a more neutral kind of language. Um, so, two pedals. The, the gas pedal and the brake pedal 
are what's called an interface, or user interface. They're sort of the means of communication between a human being and the machine, the car. Um, so on the driver's side of this abstraction barrier, so an interface is also called an abstraction barrier. It's like a wall, and on one side of the wall you think in high level, well, a horizontal wall. On one side you think in high level terms, and down on the bottom you think in low level terms about how it works. So above the abstraction barrier, the driver just has to know right pedal faster, left pedal slower. Um, and that is about the behavior of the car, what the car does in response to you pushing the pedals. Um, now, once that interface became standard, that wasn't the end of inventing new technology. So above the abstraction barrier, things haven't changed very much. The automatic transmission made a big change in the user interface. There haven't been many changes in the user interface, and it's as significant as that since then. But there have been huge changes on the other side of the abstraction barrier. Um, so originally, for example, when you pushed the gas pedal, you were mechanically operating a little lever that adjusted a valve that controlled the ratio of gasoline to air going into the cylinders in the engine. So you made the car go faster by making the fuel-air mixture have more fuel and less air. Okay? And you did that very mechanically by pushing on the pedal. That's not true today. Today, when you push the pedal, all it does is uh, send a signal to a computer. And the computer can sense exactly how far down you've pushed the pedal. And the computer takes that into account in uh, adjusting the fuel-air mixture, but it looks at other things, too. It looks at how fast you're going and what gear you're in and um, whether you're going uphill or downhill and many other things that, that affect what it, what it does. And um, also, the forming of that fuel-air mixture is now done separately for each engine cylinder. So instead of having what there used to be in old cars, the carburetor, which there was one of, now every engine cylinder has its own fuel injector that does this fuel-air mixture thing. So there have been huge changes underneath the abstraction barrier. But um, the engineers who built that new technology could have, for every change in the underlying technology, put some lights and switches on the dashboard to help you control the technology more finely. But they wisely didn't do that. They didn't change the interface above the abstraction barrier. Okay? Uh, they changed a lot below the abstraction barrier, but they tried to make it so that it was still true. You push the pedal more, the car goes faster. And you didn't have to think about um, how that worked beneath the surface. Um, the same thing is true about the brake pedal. It used to be originally that you push the brake pedal and you were mechanically squeezing the wheels. Okay, you were operating little pads that rubbed against the wheels to slow the car down. And you did that with the strength of your foot. Um, so you had to be strong originally to drive a car. And that wasn't so good, so they invented power brakes. So you push down on the brake pedal, you are operating um, a hydraulic cylinder, which is this piece of machinery that essentially amplifies the power of your foot. And it's the brake cylinder that actually squeezes the wheel to stop the car. Um, except that isn't quite true. That was true for a while. When they first invented power brakes, that was how it worked. Your foot went through an intermediary to get to the actual brakes. And then there were a few accidents because people's engine failed on the road. And so um, the hydraulic system stopped working. And so they pushed the brake pedal and nothing happened. And you know, they had car crashes. So now you don't actually have power brakes. What you have is power-assisted brakes. 
in which you push the pedal and you're doing two things. You're operating a hydraulic cylinder that does most of the work of stopping the car, but also there's a direct mechanical linkage from your foot to the brake so that you know, if your engine dies on the highway, you can stop the car. Um, these days, they have anti-lock brakes, which means between your foot and the hydraulic cylinder, there's a computer. And that computer um, looks at various aspects of how the wheels are turning to decide if you're about to go into a skid. And if so, it overrules you. You're slamming on the brakes, and the computer in the car is saying, nope, if I actually operate the brakes that fast, this car is going to go into a skid, and so it kind of pulses the brakes. And you can feel the anti-lock brake pushing back on the pedal. Um, and so, again, there's a very complicated interface using various levels of abstraction um, underneath the brake pedal. But as far as you're concerned, it's still push the pedal, stop the car. Okay? Um, and the point of all this technology is to make that more true so that no matter what the road conditions are, you push the pedal, it slows the car down, you push it harder, it stops the car. Um, and again, with the brake system, they could have put a lot of lights and switches on the dashboard to help you control it, uh, but they wisely didn't. Um, although, footnote to that, these days, there are automatic transmissions that pretend to be manual transmissions uh, because young men like to feel that they are controlling the car. And so there are all these extra widgets that you can operate if you want. So there's sort of normal mode where the car just drives itself and pseudo manual mode where you can actually change the gear shift and make your fuel economy worse and make your engine performance worse but feel like you're in charge. Um, okay. So... There are two aspects to abstraction that you have to know about. The one I've been talking about up to now mainly is hiding details. So you're doing something very, very complicated, and you find a way to develop a simpler way of thinking about it, where you sweep a lot of details under the rug. Um, the other aspect of abstraction is generalizing patterns. Um, so... Uh, to illustrate that, I want to talk about the wheels of the car. You know, there's four of them, right? The front ones and the back ones. And um, they're actually different from each other. The front wheels are the ones that steer the car. Footnote, technology marches on. You can now get cars in which the back wheels also turn a little bit. Um, and this is supposed to improve your turning circle and help prevent skids. Uh, but mostly the front wheels steer the car. Because um, if you think about it, if you steered from the back, the car would go the opposite of the way you think it's going, and it wouldn't work very well. Um, depending on what model car you get, the front wheels may also be pulling the car, providing the power to run the car. Or the back wheels might be pushing the car. That's called front-wheel drive and rear-wheel drive. And then there's also four-wheel drive where all four wheels are, are under power. Um, so the front wheels and the rear wheels are different from each other. That's the point. But in many ways, they're the same. They're round. They're you know full, made out of rubber with air inside. Um, and so as a kind of abstraction, uh, you as a car driver are allowed to think about it as if the wheels were all the same. Okay, they make the wheels all look the same and they're all the same size and all of that stuff. They don't have to do that. Remember those, and, well you don't remember, but have you seen pictures of really old bicycles that have a huge rear wheel and a tiny front wheel? Um, what, huge front wheel and a tiny rear wheel? Okay, whatever, yeah. One of those. Um, well, they could have 
done front wheels and rear wheels of cars, something like that. They probably wouldn't do it to such an extreme extent, but it could have turned out to be a slightly better uh, engineering fit to have the front wheels bigger or something. Um, but it's much simpler to have them all the same size. So that's taking things that are almost the same but a little different and combining them into one pattern. So we can say, use this pattern, and then you only have to talk about those details which are different in different cases. Okay? So uh, you're going to be working with um, the scratch programming language on the computer, and you want to draw a square. So you could write a program to draw a square that's an inch by an inch. And then you could write a separate program to draw a square that's two inches by two inches, and so on. Um, but the other thing to do is draw, write a program that says, draw a square, and when I use this program, I give it an input saying how big it should be. Okay? So instead of having a lot of separate programs to draw different kinds of squares, you just have one program to draw any square. That's also abstraction. Um, and it's the kind of abstraction that's about generalizing patterns. Now, a cautionary note here. Uh, abstraction is not the only concern when you're doing engineering. And sometimes you'll see situations in which engineers decide not to generalize patterns. So my example of that is um, some cars um, recently have different sized wiper blades for the two wiper blades in the front of the car. Um, so there'll be, I think this is right, a small one on the driver's side and a bigger one on the passenger side, typically. And to make this work, there's a lot of complicated engineering of the motion of the passenger side one. So it doesn't just go bloop, bloop. It goes like that um, to sort of cover more of the windshield. It's really, anyway, so the cost of that is when it's time to replace your wiper blades, you can't just go in and say, give me two 14-inch wiper blades. right? You have to get this one for the left and this one for the right. Um, so it's a little bit harder to think about, but... Um, it cleans the windshield better. So that's an engineering trade-off. Um, all else being equal, it's better to abstract, to find common patterns, um, to find ways of chunking things together and use them. But every once in a while, um, for some efficiency reason, people decide not to do that. Um, that's sort of upper division computer science. OK. Um, oh, I may finish early. So how does abstraction work in computer programming? Um, well, let me describe Scratch a little bit, um, which you're going to see, I guess, today, today, this afternoon. Um, so here's your computer screen, and off on the left is a menu of things that it knows how to do. And on the right, there's a stage, which is a little window where there's um, a cat. And it doesn't have to be a cat. You can change the shape. But when you start it up, it's a cat, also named Scratch, um, who carries out the instructions that you say to do. Like you say, um, move 10 steps. And the cat sort of jumps. 10 steps over on the screen, in whichever direction it's facing. Um, and there's a turn command that changes what direction it's facing. But here's this cat, and you see a cat, boop, like that, move on the screen. OK? Well, there isn't really a cat inside your computer. Um, what there really is is pixels. It's an abbreviation for picture element. Uh, Dan's the graphics guy, so he's going to tell you all about that later on. But um, what looks like a cat is actually a bunch of pixels of different colors. And what it entails, what has to happen when you say to move the cat is we have to erase all those pixels where the cat was, meaning turn them to white or whatever the color of the screen background is, and then draw a new set of pixels someplace else. 
And that actually happens dot by dot, right? deep inside um, Scratch, which is itself a computer program. It's a programming language, so that's an abstraction. As far as you're concerned, Scratch is just given, and you're programming in Scratch. So you're taking these blocks, like move so many steps, and linking them together to make what's called a script um, that tells the cat to do a bunch of different things. Um, and Scratch is the underpinning of allowing you to do that programming in that way. But Scratch is itself a computer program written in terms of a lower level abstraction. Um, it actually happens to be written in a language called Smalltalk um, that's pretty obscure otherwise, um, but of interest. You'll hear a little bit about it in 61A if you do that. Um, and Smalltalk is sort of closer to how the computer hardware works, but still pretty high level. And there are lower level languages than that. And finally, you get to the language the machine actually speaks. So Scratch is an abstraction. And every single thing you do in Scratch involves bazillions of abstractions that you don't even have to think about. As far as you're concerned, that's a cat. There really is a cat inside the computer. right? And you can tell it to do things, and it'll do them. So I guess it really should have been a dog, because you know cats don't do what you tell them to do. But um, they didn't think of that. I don't know why. Um, OK, so if the abstraction is working well, then you don't even think about it as an abstraction. So you know, think about all the things you do with computers that have nothing to do with this class. OK, um, so you run a browser. You run Firefox or Safari or Chrome or something. Anybody run Internet Explorer? Don't do it. It's a bad idea. <laughs> That's how you get viruses on your computer. Um, so you run a browser, and either you type in you know, google.com, or else maybe you click on a thing on the um, uh, bookmarks toolbar that says Google. And up pops this thing on your screen that says, you know, enter your search query here. Um, well, how did that happen? You take it for granted, but it's hugely complicated. Um, we're going to be talking yeah, about client-server stuff later on. That's in the Dan actually has this all memorized. I don't. Um, but not only is a lot of complicated stuff going on on your computer, but a lot of complicated stuff is going on on Google's computers, of which there are a lot, and many, many different computers in between. So you know, um, if you do it on campus, uh, there are other computers on campus at Berkeley whose job it is to forward your message from the computer on your desk or on your lap to the outside world. And then, um, who do we get our internet from? It used to be Sprint at one point. Oh, might be. Anyway, so let's say it's Sprint. Their computers have to figure out where Google is. Right? And that's actually a little tricky because Google is everywhere. Um, but so there's all this complicated handshaking going on. And all you see is there's this screen that pops up, and you type something in. Um, and then it does this search. And you get results more or less instantly, right? Think about how amazing that is. Um, and making that work is layers and layers and layers of abstraction. OK, so that's abstraction in computer programming. Um, OK, so let me tell you a little bit about BYOB, because that's the, sort of the end of the story about abstraction. Um, in Scratch, you can take a bunch of commands that Scratch knows how to do and sort of click them together. They're, they're kind of cute. They're shaped like Lego bricks. And you're supposed to think of it as snapping Lego bricks together. Um, so here they are, boom, 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 boom. And you can say, do this. And it does the first one, and the second one, and the third one, and so on. What you can't do in Scratch is take that sequence of things and give it a name to make it a new block uh, that will appear in the menu so that you can use it 
to build other blocks. And that's abstraction, right? Instead of talking about the little low-level things, so like um, move so many steps and turn so many degrees, instead of that, you make it so that you can talk about square, right? That's a kind of abstraction, which you can't do in Scratch. Um, but you can in BYOB. The name BYOB actually does not stand for what you think it does. It stands for build your own blocks. And the main thing that it lets you do is add blocks to the Scratch menu. Um, it's a huge missing feature. Uh, they're actually going to put it in Scratch in version 2.0, which is coming out someday. Um, but it's not clear that they're going to put it in in full generality. They haven't really decided yet how they're going to do it. Um, that basic enabling technology um, lets you do something called recursion. There are, among the big ideas in this class, two of them really are about how you write a computer program. The others are about you know, social things or or what computers are good for, kinds of things. Um, but two of them are, are about programming. And the first one is called recursion, um, which you'll learn about later. I'm not even going to tell you what it means right now. Um, but recursion and being able to build your own block is the enabling technology for that. Um, and the other big idea that we're going to talk about is, um, it actually has two names, two aspects of the same thing, higher order functions and procedure as data. And the enabling technology for that is being able to take a, a block that you created or a block that came with Scratch or whatever, and instead of putting it in a program, put it in a data structure. So make it, use it the way you would use a number or a string of characters or something like that. Make it data. And procedures as data is the other big uh, programming idea that's in BYOB that's not in Scratch. Um, and that you're going to be learning about in lecture as well as in lab. Okay, we have 12 minutes. Questions? Yeah? Uh, you can have Scratch on your computer. You can have BYOB on your computer. Uh, they're both free software. Um, in fact, I don't know. Okay. Okay. So fine. From the course webpage, you can get there. Um, oh, by the way, um, a word of thanks to uh, the person who actually did all the programming work of making BYOB. Um, his name is Jens Munig. Um, he's not here. He lives in Germany. He's a lawyer of all things. Um, BYOB is kind of his spare time hobby, and uh, he's done an amazing piece of work for it. I've done a lot of design and documentation and stuff, but he did all the actual programming. So thanks, Jens. Other questions? Yeah. So You're next. This class will prepare us for 61A. Yes. Um, the prerequisite for 61A is knowing how to program a recursive function. So recursion, the first of those big ideas about programming that I mentioned, is the key idea that you need for 61A. Yeah. Yes. Of, you mean making, making, moving it? No. no. Oh, can you add the class? Yes. Uh, the answer is yes. How many, how many vacant chairs do we have in this room? Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Yeah, you guys would actually all fit in chairs. So next time, I mean, it's not worth it right now, but next time um, it would be really good if people who come early, you know, I know I always like to sit by the aisle too, but it's a pain in the neck. So, yeah, yes? Uh, we can't stop this class preparing us for 61A. I know that Seek DS3, something like that, is also is one more, it's going to prepare us more than the other. There's, yeah, there's CS3S, which is a self paced version of the old class, still exists. Um, 
bear in mind that we're teaching this class for the first time. Right. Our plan is that this class will totally prepare you for 61A as well as 3S would. Um, 3S has a slight edge in that the programming language that they use is Scheme, which is the same language 61A uses. Um, but our idea at Berkeley is that after the first time, learning a new programming language is not a big deal. So, you know, at the end, we'll do some talking about Scheme a little bit. But, um, but essentially what we've done with BYOB, because um, all the ideas really came from Scheme, what we've done is taken Scheme and disguise it as Scratch. Um, so you're really going to see the same ideas in it. And this class will be more fun because we talk about all that other stuff too. And because Dan is, well, you've seen. <laughs> okay. By the way, Dan's a PowerPoint guy. I hate PowerPoint. Um, so when he's up, you'll see all kinds of pictures and everything. Um, when I'm lecturing, uh, either it'll be just like this or it'll be um, typing at BYOB to show you, you know, how a recursion works or something. Um, so... I hate power. Dan can tell you why he loves PowerPoint. I hate PowerPoint because it kind of makes you always say the same thing and not pay any attention to your audience. And you talk too fast when you're doing PowerPoint. So there you are. In my, in my class, Social Implications of Computers, one of the things we read is um, a New Yorker article that was an interview of the guy who invented PowerPoint about how terrible it is. Because he thinks it's terrible too. So. <laughs> anyway, other questions? Yeah. Calculus, that is Math 1A, outside of being highly, highly recommended for a computer science minor or major, is it in any way mandatory as a prerequisite for any of Yes, Math 1A is a co-requisite for 61A. Okay. Um, yeah, so you really are supposed to do that. Are you a math hater? Hater. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, great. Then you want to take math one anyway. Oh, I should say, I'm sorry. There's something I should say. Um, I'm gonna, can I erase this? Okay, in ordinary non-computer science vocabulary, when people talk about something as being abstract, they mean sort of removed from common experience. And the opposite of that is concrete, something you can actually look at. So in ordinary language, people would mostly say, things like this are concrete. But you can't see atoms or protons or quarks. Those are abstract, and the big pieces are abstract also. So concrete is kind of in the middle. That's normal usage of language. That's not computer science usage of language. In computer science, we mean what's built in terms of what. 
So the higher up you are in this chart, the more abstract, and the lower down you are, the more concrete. So concrete is quarks. Those are kind of the fundamental building blocks. And then there's a layer of abstraction, and you put quarks together in certain ways, and you get protons and neutrons and electrons, and you put those together in certain ways, and you get atoms and molecules, and then you get materials, and then you get little parts you can buy in the parts store, and then you get big functional units, and then you get even bigger functional units, and so on. Okay? So when we talk about abstraction, it doesn't mean far removed from your experience. It means built in terms of other things. Okay? So try not to get confused by that. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, right, sure. You can go, I mean, you know, you can go below quarks. You know, there are these string things, maybe. <laughs> or something. Um, I be, I'm not a physicist, but I believe the current state of things is they know that quarks can't be the bottom, but they don't know exactly for sure what comes next. Um, and, yeah, we can take, you know, bunches of cars and make a road out of them and so on. Okay. Um, one more question? Or are we ready to go? All right, welcome to the call. Oh, wait, one question. Yes. Is the course can it be ta can it be taken by X majors? Yes, absolutely. Um, if most X majors won't need it because you learn to program in high school or something. Yes. Is there a lot of math in this course? Is there a lot of math in this course? No, not at all. It's you know. We're, we're expecting English majors to thrive. 